What is good? We're back. We got a big one. We got a fun one. We're going to have multiple episodes out of this. It was like herding cats, but it'll be worth it in the end. We have some of the best minds in the business here to do a uh, industry mock. It's going to be super flex, tight end, premium, rookie mock. Um, and we got we got a great lineup for you, and we're super excited. Uh, was was a decent amount of work, so you know, we really we really hope you enjoy it. Uh, but you know, we we really enjoyed it. It was interesting to see everybody's process, and you know, be sure to like, subscribe, comment below so you can catch all these videos. Uh, and one quick little side note: we weren't able to get up with Angelo FF, uh, so he sent his uh, picks in pre-recorded. Uh, so you know be a little different when you get to Angelo's picks each round. Let's start the show. To lead us off at the one one, it's none other than our than our guy JB. What's up, buddy? It's been a while. How you doing? I know. Thanks for having me. I'm, it's always an honor and a pr- privilege. The the fact that you guys want me to come back. You know, so always. maybe that's that says something about you guys that you willingly yeah, choose to yeah. associate with I me, mean I'm but. trying to figure out how to get you on the payroll over here so you know I've... lady in the streets and a freak in the sheets <laughs> spread sheets let's I you know you got a tough decision here at the one one how did you do it you know yeah. what were the analytics that told you that who you should take here at one one it just said Bijan it did <laughs> I, I put all the inputs in it just spit out Bijan uh you know honestly I don't think there's a massive gap right now, especially from an upside perspective, going Bijan or Anthony Richardson. Um, I saw that little knee dip you kind of did before you said that. Just, <laughs> uh, just <laughs> as you kind of. Uh, I told I, 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 I had to stand for this episode. The desk is up. Uh, that's not all that's rising over here, boys. Um, but no, I mean, Bijan, like. We know there's not much to go into here. We we know the profile. Yeah. Yeah. We know the draft capital. We know the landing spot. It checks every box analytically speaking. He's got the physical profile we want for a running back. And I I don't want to say he's probably one of the safest running back prospects we've seen, but he's one of the safest running back prospects we've seen. Yeah. So with the 101, give me Bijan. Uh you know, looking at these these high end running backs coming in, uh, and then even like a player like a Brees Hall, there's going to be start, there's going to start to be more separation between these high end running backs in the middle of the pack because the the age separation, mm-hmm. and you see these guys kind of getting a little bit older, and we're going to see that gap. So give me what I believe to be already the dynasty running back one. I'm going to take him over JT. I'm going to take him over Brees Hall, uh, McCaffrey, everybody down there. Brees, so, uh, Brees not injured and, and, you know, just has a nice projected end of the season that he had. Would would would, it, would he could he be the one one for you or is it just. I, I don't th- I, I think I'm too jacked up on. Bijan. <laughs> yeah, I, All right. I, I would go Bijan. I mean, it's easy to say that now because it, it, it has happened. happened. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I would like to. You know, erasing that from my memory, I I would still go Bijan. There was some consideration for Richardson though here too, or no, or at one. Yeah, I mean, I just I think that we're going through projections over at Dynasty Theory, and I just think that Good Patreon, for, go ahead and sign up if you're not. So yeah, as little as five bucks a month, and you get to talk my ear off all day, every day. What's what's not to love? Yeah, yeah. But that the the ceiling is so high with Richardson, but I also think the floor is just tremendously high as long as he is on the field. Yeah. You know, and the the bottom dropping out, sure, that's a concern as we head towards the end of his rookie deal. But going into a uh, you know, an organization that's looking to right the ship from the quarterback position, something they haven't been able to do since Andrew Luck retired. Um, there, there's tremendous upside there. But I have not been in a situation where I've had the 101 in a 12 team league and I took Richardson. So, I mean, I, I think it's a close second, but I would still obviously go Bijan here. Yeah, I think that's the general consensus. But would you have to get blown away to make the trade just because you know that that's kind of what the value maybe is? Or, or are you okay with maybe, you know, not a wild deal to just swap those two picks? 
No, I honestly like the way drafts have played out in in my roster ship up to this point. Uh, the guys that I've been getting in the 206, 207, 208 range, give me that with the 102. And I'm okay with that. Give me a uh, Roshan Johnson or a Tank Bigsby with Anthony Richardson. And I know a lot of people are going to say, hey, you're probably leaving value on the table. And you are you might be able to run into somebody that's going to give you, you know, whatever you ask for, essentially. Mm-hmm. But I think for the most part, people are... Uh, I don't want to say cooling down on B. John Robinson, but I personally haven't seen those wild 101 trades that we were seeing in January and February. Yeah. So middle second value just to move back the one spot. That's something I would certainly do. All right. Well, where where can we find all your stuff? And we're not going to take up too much time on the one one here because it's pretty easy, but nice. Nice. Uh, you made it interesting, at least. So. So well done, sir. Even if you don't feel that way, it's, it's good programming. No, so. I do. I do <laughs> feel that way, though. I know. And I know you do. I know you do. I mean, you. I could talk about paint drying with you guys for a couple hours. <laughs> so the yeah. fact that we stretched out 101 to about five minutes, I, you know, whatever. Uh, sure. Yeah, find me on Twitter at the Bauer Club. Uh, one of the hosts of Dynasty Theory at Dynasty Theory FF. We're live every Tuesday night. We're part of the DLF Family Podcast. Uh, we have our Patreon as little as five bucks a month. Tears, projections. Uh, a weekly uh, additional weekly content, and then we have our Discord, which is a fantastic community. So, if you are so inclined, come check it out. Yeah, uh, I second second that. We are in the patron, we are a patron member over there, and it's uh, it's good stuff. So check that out. So JB, we'll see you at uh, at two one. All right, with the coveted one two spot, we got Matt Hicks of the Rookie Big Board. How you doing, man? Nice to see you. What were we thinking at, at one two here? Yeah, glad to be back this year again for this exercise. 102, Anthony Richardson, very happy to take him here. You know, with Richardson uh, in a super flex league, I'm drafting for that upside. He's got the tools. He has the big arm, uh, different levels of athleticism. He's athletic, he's fast, and he's physical as a runner. I love the landing spot in Indianapolis. I was right on the cusp of Richardson being my QB one pre-draft. You get that Indianapolis landing spot. I believe in that Shane Steichen developmental uh, ceiling that he brings into it there. So really happy to take Richardson 102. This is a pretty, you know, standard pick for me in my super flex leagues this year. Not too much thought behind it. Yeah. I, I I almost had a hard time with the intro because I'm like, I don't even, there's nothing to talk about here. We, it's Anthony Richardson, right? It's got to be. Um, so if you, would you be trying to trade up to Bijan, I guess would be my my question if possible here. Or, or are you just stoked with Anthony Richardson? Yeah, you know, if I could get up to Bijan without selling the farm too too much, I'd be definitely into doing that. It's no knock on Richardson, but you know, Bijan Robinson for me is my second highest graded prospect ever, even mm-hmm. in a super flex format. I very much overvalue or, or prioritize the value of the quarterback position. And Bijan still is right up there just below Trevor Lawrence. So he's somebody that I would absolutely trade up to get and would trade, uh, you know, multiple high uh, rookie draft assets to go ahead and do that. But Richardson, not a bad consolation prize at all. No, Bijan just taking some of the guesswork out of it. You're pretty confident with with what you're getting there. So, but you may have to pay a premium. Would there be any talk of trading down if possible? Yeah, you know, I would entertain it. If I was looking at a roster where, you know, I was looking at a a real long term rebuild, right? Uh, I was lacking depth. I'd be willing to trade back, you know, 102 to 105 feels like a tier break right now. Um, You know, you get Bryce Young, you get Jameer Gibbs, you get CJ Stroud in that range. And then you you have kind of like a quote mini tier in six and seven for me with the two wide receivers. So I'd be willing to trade down within especially that 102 to 105 tier. If I could pick back up future first round picks, I'd be looking to get at least a 24 first in there. Uh, depending on how far I'm moving back would be, you know, looking at acquiring a second round pick in 23 as well. I feel you with that. I'm, I think I'm mostly just sticking with Richardson there for me personally. Yeah. I just love, I just love the the upside and already we see the value uh, just in the startups that we're doing right now of, of Anthony Richardson already really taken over and, you know, the coveted 
uh, fantasy quarterback with with legs, the Justin Fields of this year. So I'm 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 down with Anthony Richardson. What's your before we wrap up on this pick here? What's your thoughts on on Bryce or or, or Stroud? Do you have a a strong preference, or you you feel similarly about them? Yeah, I like Bryce Young. Bryce Young was my pre-draft quarterback one. You know, I was looking for an excuse to put Richardson above him. And like I mentioned, Indianapolis did help with that. (laughs) But Carolina is a good landing spot for Bryce Young. They're one of the better offensive lines in the NFL. They do have a decent variety of weapons. I know we're not talking about high level weapons, but if you look at what they've built there, you know, Adam Thielen in a possession wide receiver, you have DJ Chark and Terrace Marshall who can take the top off of defenses. They got a boundary guy in Jonathan Bingo. And I wouldn't sleep on Hayden Hurst as a, as a, you know, safety blanket tight end either. And of course, you know, a a balanced running game too with Miles Sanders, who's a decent check down option. So I think they've actually surrounded Bryce Young with a lot of good pieces and Again, another coaching staff that I think we can lean into and have some trust in with Frank Reich, Luke McCown, a lot of good uh, coaches kind of assembled in that Carolina front office. So there's a lot to like. And of course, young skill set as well. You know, I'm, he was clearly highly rated for me. I said he was my QB one pre draft. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think Bryce Young is somebody that I would still be happy to get a good amount of exposure to, but he doesn't have that ceiling, right? That you get with Anthony Richardson. And I think that's why we've settled, you know, a, a a small tier down with uh, Richardson and Young. Gotcha. All right. Uh, where can we find all of your work before we uh, move on to one three here? Yeah, Rookie Big Board on YouTube, your favorite podcast channel, patreon.com slash rookie big board, doing rookie content all year round. We were talking <laughs> pre-show, man. We're already on to the 2024 class and the analysis that comes with that. Yeah, you guys are you guys are sick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We are uh, we're a bunch of sickos and we love it. We'll catch you at two two. All right. So I was drafting from the 103 slot here. And with my first pick in the first round at 103, I took Bryce Young um, over CJ Stroud, Jameer Gibbs, and Jackson Smith, Nick Jigba. Um, reason being is for me, I think Young has sneaky rushing upside. And this is, you know, this is going to be a tight end premium league, super flex. Um, and then it's four point or six point per touchdown. I think Young's going to have the two things that you really look for in quarterbacks. It's it's accuracy and negating turnovers. That's a big one. And then also too, the rushing upside, I think is there with Young and pretty prevalent. So if you're at the one three and deciding between Young and Stroud and Gibbs, I like Young for long-term upside as well as kind of a safety net in terms of floor because of the rushing too. All right. So at one four, we have Mr. Garrett Price of, I mean, I, I think, you know, by now the dynasty nerds, how you doing, man? I'm doing really good. How you guys doing? Doing well, doing well. So if anybody doesn't know, where where can they find you? Yeah, find me on Twitter at Dynasty Price. And everything I do is over at DynastyNerds.com. Perfect. Uh, which, Hashtag you know, nerd herd. An institution right. all on its own. Yeah. Um, at 1-4. So what, uh, who is the selection here? All right. So things kind of worked out nicely with this pick anyway. Uh, because... One four is a very easy spot to pick in super flex drafts. It's which quarterback fell to me at mm-hmm. one four. That's that's really what it is. Uh, and I I'm a guy that actually had Stroud as my quarterback too. So and I know he typically falls to the third one. So I I ate this position up. I was like, oh, I get I get Stroud here. I can just chill, take my guy. Uh, so it, it worked out really well. I think he's a a really accurate quarterback. I think he's really safe. There's not a lot of like huge blemishes on him. One of my biggest concerns with him going into the year was how he dealt with pressure because I didn't think he did that very well in his junior campaign, but I thought he really improved. And specifically when you look at the, uh, not the national championship game, but the uh, college football playoff game against Georgia, which is basically an NFL defense. They're basically the Eagles. Uh, (laughs) So going against that type of competition for him to put together one of, if not his best game of his college career. And then we even saw a little more athleticism than we had seen out of him before, which, you know, if we go back a few years to Justin Fields, everyone knew Justin Fields was a good athlete, but I don't think anybody thought that he was going to be like challenging Lamar Jackson as the best rushing (laughs) quarterback in the NFL. So that's something I even heard with Ryan day. Uh, I heard an interview with him right before the draft and they asked him about that. And they said, he's like, well, here's the thing. I don't want my quarterbacks to run a lot because 
if he gets hurt, I got to start over from ground zero. Like I'm counting a lot of these guys. So I, if anything that the college guys or the NFL guys don't get to see from these, from these quarterbacks, it, that's on me because I just don't put them in positions to do that very often. So that was something else that I thought, you know, is he ever going to be a, you know, 700 rush yards a season kind of guy? No, but could he maybe be a three, three fifty that we didn't expect originally? I think that's in the realm of possibility. Yeah, I, I certainly do. And and I think you said it well there. Was there any scenario where you would take Gibbs or JSN at 104? Not in a super flex league. No, I, I'm a big draft, the best available player. So like even I'm in situations this year where I'm like set at quarterback, but I pick 102. I'm still taking Anthony Richardson, like even though I'm set at quarterback and I'll make trades later or I'll trade out of the pick if I have to. But if I'm staying pat, I'm going to take the best available player based on the format. And these quarterbacks, you you get top 10 draft capital. You, you're, you got to go in the top half of the first round. And I like Gibbs a lot. I like JSN a lot. But I, for me, you got to go Stroud there. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's a, the the one one through six seems like a pretty easy position to yeah. be in. Kind of does it does the work for you now. If you want to swap JSN and Gibbs around, that's up to you, personal sure. preference or whatever. But it does seem like, you know, and it does likely seem that Stroud is usually the one for. Would you have been bummed if it was Bryce Young? Does that change your decision at all, or is it just same? No, I would have I would have taken Young and been very happy about it. Yeah. And then I would have lied to you guys and said how much I loved Bryce Young. And, you know, <laughs> no, no, I, I I think Bryce Young is it's, and CJ Stroud are, are neck and neck. And, you know, you could even if you wanted to to hype those guys up, they're safer probably than Anthony Richardson. But I think Richardson's definitely a top guy with his ceiling and that getting paired with Steichen like that was just a thing of yeah. beauty. So, sure. Yeah, sure. I couldn't ask for anything better. All right, man. Well, like I said, I think this was pretty easy, so not much more discussion here. We'll see you at 2-4. Sounds good. All right, so we're at 1-5 with Corey from the Fantasy Stock Exchange. How you doing, man? Doing good, doing good. Um, most super flex drafts, the 1-5 is a pivot point. <laughs> most of the time you got you know some of these quarterbacks sliding down the board. Sometimes you got... Uh, you know, the decision between the skill position players, you know, Sands, Bijan Robinson. And that's the position I found myself in with right. Bijan going one on one and, you know, the other the top three quarterbacks going ahead of me. For me, it comes down to uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, the Seahawks and Jameer Gibbs of the Detroit Lions. And given the the positional scarcity at running back, there's not a ton of, you know, high, high end running backs that you want to own in Dynasty that you can project for four to five, six years, potentially. And the fact that Gibbs went in the top 12 of the NFL draft, which pretty much nobody was expecting uh, to an offense last year that scored, you know, the fifth most points in the league. Uh, I went with Jameer Gibbs there at 105 for the Lions. I think he's in a position to basically be exactly what we all wanted DeAndre Swift to be for all those years. Yeah. And I mean, shit, even when Gibbs was on the field, he kind of I think he's better than Gibbs and Gibbs was even still producing at a fairly high clip when when available and utilized um, Swift Swift. Yeah. Um, was there, if you could trade, if there was an option to move out of this pick, would you, is that something that you would normally do? Or are you, because of the scarcity and it's a rookie draft, probably the cheapest way to acquire a good running back. Is that what, what would be your thought process there? Yeah. I mean, usually when I'm looking to move around in rookie drafts, it'll usually be dependent on my team. So if I'm in a position where I needed, you know, franchise quarterbacks because I'm in, you know, a long term productive struggle type of situation, I probably would have looked to move up either to, you know, get Richardson, Young, Stroud, whatever guy uh, I'm, you know, super high on for me. That's that's Bryce Young typically because I think he's the best value and I, I like his projection the most. In, in a situation like this where I don't have a, you know, a team to work with or whatever, I also think Gibbs is just a great you know, neutral situation pick because you know, the dynasty market is so heavily influenced by age and you know, high draft capital running back, especially most, uh, most everybody's playing in PPR leagues. Obviously, Gibbs is going to have a ton of value in that type of format. So I'm cool. You know, this is not really a spot I'd be looking to trade out of most of the time. I'd be you know, happy to take Jameer Gibbs, maybe JSN if I had an absolutely loaded running back core on a hypothetical team. How many times out of 10 are you taking Gibbs over Jason? 
probably like nine out of ten. Unless my right. unless my running back core was just like I already had the one one, and maybe had Brees on my roster already too, and you know maybe some other depth options like Damian Pierce types or something like that. And mm. I was weak at wide receiver. I might consider sliding down a pick or two, taking whatever of of JSN Jordan Addison falls to me, and you know pocketing a second rounder next year or something like yeah. that. But for the most part, I think the the market consensus is Jameer Gibbs over JSN because, you know, running back is such a highly coveted position and Gibbs is already at the top five running back in dynasty. Whereas JSN has got some work to do to get ahead of those, you know, second year receivers that we saw last year. And of course the, you know, the top end LSU guys and lamb and Brown and Waddle and all those dudes. So the, prioritization comes down to a little bit more based on draft capital here for, for the running back position. Yeah. I mean, they, they both get first round capital, so it's not mm-hmm. a, it's not a, a huge uh, difference to huge discrepancy between him and JSN. I think it would, it would really come down to liquidity on the market for me for, for mm-hmm. Jameer Gibbs. If I had a team neutral situation and I got Gibbs versus JSN, I know Gibbs is going to hold a, a ton of trade value given that he plays running back. And uh, in, you know, PPR formats, like I said, he's an easy projection for at least DeAndre Swift's type of workload. Yeah, you're a man after our own hearts taking the running back here first. I feel like most people we have on. Yeah, would would disagree. They're going to be mad at at the Lions because that they shouldn't have spent that draft capital on him. And he's sub 200 pounds, so he probably could never be any good. What's what's the that doesn't the the sub 200 thing doesn't worry you at all? I mean, it doesn't worry us, but, I'm you know, clearly not. Well, okay. So here's the thing. I'm like very much in the same vein. Like Lions absolutely should not have spent a top <laughs> well, pick on a, two, a sub 200 pound running but back. They did. Yeah, but they did. And it's, you know, it's not my money. It's not my draft pick that I spent. I'm just going to react to what they did. And I think when the market is so sure that, you know, the running back position is devalued and, you know, none of these guys are valuable. When we actually get one that projects to be very valuable, like Bijan, obviously at 101 Gibbs here at 105, then they actually should be worth a lot of money. And, you know, a lot of draft picks and a lot of that kind of uh, stuff. So if you're, you know, talking the top five to seven dynasty running backs, those guys, in my opinion, are valuable. But it's once you get outside of those guys where you get the question marks, you know, about workload and age with some of these like Eckler, Chubb, you know, uh, type of running backs. So for me, Gibbs holds a lot of value on the market, but I am typically, you know, a a zero RB hero RB type of dude uh, in redraft leagues, especially. Yeah. So what was there another running back here in the first round that you would prioritize over any of these other wide receivers that typically go like basically JSN, Johnston, Addison, Flowers? No, no. I love Charbonnet pre-draft. He may have slipped over, you know, Flowers and Johnston if he had gotten a great landing spot. But of course, we all know what happened where he went to the Seattle Seahawks <laughs> uh, who already have Kenneth Walker. So I think Charbonnet is a uh, he, he's a good value in most drafts right now, but mm-hmm. I uh, I wish he would have went to like you know the Bengals or the Chargers or something like that in the second round. Last question: What? How do you feel about that Kincaid at one seven? Kincaid at one seven. If it's a two point tight end premium, I can get behind it. I personally think Michael Mayer was the better prospect. Um, so I've been of the opinion that I'm just going to let my league mates draft Dalton Kincaid and I will take Michael Mayer. I mean, a lot of picks later in this case, but most of the time it's you know a four or five pick discrepancy. So when you see something like that happen, if you're in this draft, maybe behind where Kincaid's going, do you make any moves? Do you try to move up? Do you see a value there or is you just kind of just let it you say, Hi, all right, somebody got that wrong, in my opinion, and I'm just going to wait. Oh, if I was sitting there at two five in a real draft and Jordan Addison was on the board at one nine, I would have been making calls for sure, because okay. Jordan Addison to me was neck and neck with JSN. I there most of the draft process. I had Addison above JSN. Once we started getting, you know, the testing numbers and, you know, some of the concerns uh, there with Jordan Addison, I, I moved him slightly down, but I still think, especially now that he landed in in the Vikings landing spot, that he has absolutely a case to be right there with JSN as wide receiver one from this rookie class. All right. Well, before we get out of this first round, t- tell everybody where they can find you and all your all your information. Yeah, you can find me over uh, on YouTube, Fantasy Stock Exchange, just closing in short of 20,000 subscribers right now. So definitely go check us out over there. Uh, bonus content, rankings, databases, you know, models, all that good stuff available. Flockfantasy.com slash FSE as well. Coming in at 1-6, we got your guy, uh, Ray GQ. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing? Right here at 1-6, man. 1-6. How you doing? How you doing? What were you? What were you thinking here, man? I th- it seems like it's a layup, but uh, you know what? What's your process here? Yeah, I mean, you know, given the format, the first five picks were no sort of uh, you knew who they were going to be, and that's sort mm-hmm. of who it is right now. 
uh, probably 98% of the time. So I knew sitting at 1-6, I was going to be in a good spot to get JSN, and uh, I felt good about him. He was my personal wide receiver one in the class. I thought uh, the capital was there uh, to get the opportunity. I know a lot of people are a little worried about the landing spot with DK and Tyler Lockett and the running game and then the fact that they drafted a you know a pretty good running back in the in, in the second round uh, just speaks more to probably what they want to do with that Pete Carroll style offense but I think JSN when you when when we look at this class it you know sometimes it's not even about hitting the Jamar Chases and Justin Jeffersons but it's making sure you don't you don't draft the absolute zeros and I don't think uh, JSN I just can't envision that being in his range of outcomes so for me at one six, pretty pretty layup pick, pretty pretty easy call for me, uh, given the format. Even though I was tied in premium, it was JSN. Yeah, yeah, it would it would seem that way at that point since Gibbs goes in front of you. Um, but you're taking you Gibbs. With? You're taking Gibbs over uh, JSN if you had the one five. Yeah, I'm taking Gibbs over JSN. Yeah, I mean, but you th- that is one where truly, um, let's say I'm in ten leagues. I play in ten leagues. I'd go fifty fifty. You know, portfolio. Literally, I, I don't think you can go wrong either way. And if you had a strong lean one side to the other, 60, 40, and you're still feeling good with six of six of one and four of the other. Yeah, you you trying to get up to one of those quarterbacks if you're sitting at one six here, or you you just hanging out and making that pick, or are you moving backwards, or what, what's your general thought here? The, the only quarterback for me personally, and I've I had talked about this kid uh, as my my QB one, and I was. You know, and I still maintain, depending on the format in the league, Anthony Richardson should be in consideration for the 101 overall. Mm. Um, I've taken him there multiple times. Again, I play in a literal portfolio of leagues, so I've taken mm. him multiple times at the 101. But that'd be the only one I'd move up for, and I'm pretty sure the cost to get him from 1-6 to 1-2 you know, would probably be a little more, uh, more than I'm willing to pay. Yeah. Bryce Young – maybe I don't know if I would want to pay to move up to get Bryce and I wouldn't pay to move up to get CJ Stroud. Yeah. If you were in the quarterback range to move up to Richardson, it could be more likely, but, but to be well out of that range um, and kind of being not saying stuck at one six, you're still getting the top six, but it is, seems like a costly uh, move to go up. So I didn't know if you were, I knew you were an Anthony Richardson guy, but yeah. I didn't know if you were willing to, to go all in uh, for him there. I, I don't I, I don't know, man. You know, it, this we could look back a year from now, right, and be like, man, all you had to do was, move, you know, give up, you know, Brandon Ayuk on top of that 1-6 or just – I'm just throwing a name sure, out there, sure. right, to move Kenneth Walk, whatever it is, to get Anthony Richardson. A year from now, we could be looking back and be like, man, that like you should have paid whatever that premium was because if he is good, even when and, – and I don't even say if, when he struggles because he will struggle because he's a rookie quarterback in the sure. NFL – if he could perform with Shane Steichen to the level or at least a like where we can see flashes of maybe he could be an athletic, a little more athletic version of Jalen Hurts, like you'd look back at this cost and be like, man, I wish I would have paid whatever to get him right there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think he's definitely going to struggle some, right? Struggles a little bit with accuracy, very yeah. raw, hasn't played even that many games. But we had Waldman on and he, he called him an elite learner. And you know him, he's going to show up and work. And so I don't think he's going to let the struggles like get to him. The opportunity is going to be there for a while. Great situation. Good wide receivers. I just – and then you, you watch him play, like it'll be mistake, mistake, bad throw, bad, and then like score, you know. So when it comes to fantasy, like the, ce- the floor is so right. high and the ceiling is just – out of this world you know so i yeah. think i i still probably got to go Bijan, and i probably got to go more than a 60 40 split there just because i mean you know best prospects since been prospects since been prospects you know uh <laughs> and and that's really not messing it up you're taking a, a, a small right. gamble with R- richardson you know but it's we're, we're playing fantasy football here so we're trying to put one of those F's is for fun. We're trying to put the fun back in fantasy. Anthony Richardson is a fuck ton of fun. So, uh, you know, I, you know the, the the interesting thing about it too, and it's and it's, and I hope people don't get upset by it, but I think it just speaks to the quality of guys at the one one and one two and superflex that nobody denies that Bijan Robinson is safe, um, has tremendous upside and in what we think would be a a long and prosperous career, you know, in the NFL. And nobody 
no, th- th- yes, some people are skeptical, but for the most part, people all acknowledge the fact that a rich could be just a fantasy game wrecker, right? Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're optimistic on both, you, you at the end of the day, you'll feel good about either. If both of those guys hit their theoretical ceilings, you'll feel great about either. Now you can look back on that and be like, you know, I probably should have taken the quarterback because it's super flex or you're in a situation where you're ready to go and you're like, man, I probably a rich didn't crack my lineup. You know, uh, I didn't know when to start him, you know, as a rookie, I probably should have just taken Bijan and won the league. But uh, either way, the, both of those guys have fun. Like, when we say in, it's not hyperbole, right? Like they literally could be in dynasty or fantasy producers, like their number one players at their respective positions. They have that type of capability, you know, if, if the stars align. Yeah, I agree. Um, all right. One more question before we get you out of this uh, first pick here. Uh, any, any thought to taking a tight end since it was premium? Absolutely here? not. Absolutely if not. It was, if, it was two, if it was two points per yes. reception, would you then start considering? Yes. Yes. If it were, and even then, and I think that's a great question because this is the spot you do it. Like mm-hmm. literally, if 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 this were two points per reception and let's just say the top five remain the top five, right? This is where the one six is where do you plant your flag on tight end one, whether that's Dalton Kincaid, whether it's Michael Mayer, whomever it is for you, or do you plant your flag on WR1? So for me, if it's two points per reception with JSN being the wide receiver one, I would still take JSN, but this is the pivot point right here where I think it's appropriate to take a tight end. Agree. Agree. All right, right. Tell us where we can uh, get all your media. Uh... <laughs> uh, just follow me on Twitter at Ray GQ and check out the YouTube channel at Destination Devi. Which I'm, I'm sure you guys all already are. We appreciate you and we'll see you at 2-6. Appreciate it. All right. So we're here at 1-7 with our guy, Mike. What's up, man? Where, where can we find you and what's the Twitter handle? Hey, what's up, man? Thanks for having me again on the show. Um, I am uh, Dynasty Zoltan on Twitter at Dynasty Zoltan FF. Uh, go check me out on there and uh, my Patreon under the same name for some uh, good rookie content. Yeah, it's got to got to make sure you check all that out. And uh, so you got you got an interesting pick here that I feel like the rest of the fellows might have something to say uh, when it's good. their turn to talk. Uh, so at one seven, what were you thinking leading up to this, and then and then your pick and your thoughts on the pick. Yeah, so when when I was able to choose my slot in this draft, I I picked one seven with the express intent of making this point right here. And uh, for me, Dalton Kincaid is my one seven in in you know a half tight end premium league. To me, that's partly just because I love Dalton Kincaid, and I'll get into that in a second. And partly because I don't believe in Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison as like you know no doubt about it, game breaking players. And it's pretty clear that the draft. There's a tier after the 106. You know, I, I've I've never seen anyone outside of the top six go in the top six. For me, Kincaid's that next guy because first of all, I think he's the second best pass catcher on the best offense that any of these teams landed in. I think it's the most open offense, and I think Kincaid is honestly a better pass catcher than Quentin Johnson, Jordan Addison. If you look at the matchup problems that he causes, I mean, he was the number one pass catcher on Utah. He was getting double teamed all the time. Um, I know he's a little bit older, but I don't really care about that as tight end. I'm, I'm looking for that high end upside. And for me, Jordan Addison is not going to be anything more than a wide receiver too. And that, you know, 14 points per game, like you look at Devonta Smith, who is about as good as it gets for that role. He's, he only got 15 points a game last season. That's, you know, three points per game better than the wide receiver 38. So I, I don't really see much value there. Um, and Quentin Johnson is just too big of a bust. Uh, bust risk for me so i'm i'm pretty happy to take kincaid there so what would you say to the people who constantly berate people on twitter for taking first round uh tight ends because you can trade for them the next year which i think is asinine the fact yeah i mean no, nobody's trading you uh a guy you took in the first round like kincaid for a first round or like for less than what you at, at minimum it's going to be the same first rounder that you paid for and most people are going to say pound sand i'm rolling with like unless he tears his achilles or something yeah, right. I, I think a lot of that is outdated and, and underestimates at least the the average level of like 
of team league mate that I see in my league, they know that a tight end isn't expected to produce early on. And you look at guys like a Conquo from last year who had like 420 yards. You look at Jelani Woods who had like three touchdowns and that's it. And their value went way up. I mean, obviously they were being drafted later, but even now a Conquo just went in the eighth round of a one t- of a half tight end premium league I'm in. So if that's like, you know, he didn't have the pedigree that a guy like Kincaid has who was drafting the first round. I think sure. Kincaid's floor is, you know, 500 yards. My projections, I have him for closer to 700, 750. So, I mean, someone has to catch the ball in Buffalo. Yeah, and I to your point, Kincaid. much better offense there from where Chig is. Yeah, and I don't see Kincaid doing worse than Dawson Knox has. Like, I, I think a lot of this is based on, like, Kincaid is just, he's the best red zone and vertical threat in that offense now. And they've been forcing the ball to Gabe Davis, who's been having to have some big games because of it. But if you see a mix of what Knox has been able to do and a mix of what Gabe Davis has been able to do, I think Kincaid can do that. And if he's the tight end 12 his first year, which is all, you know, which is what 700 yards will get you, you're (laughs) not going to be able to buy him for less than, you know, a first. Yes, I agree. And I I also uh, have made the point, you know, that, in premium for me, I'm trying to get those volume tight ends because yeah. I believe that that's of an advantage you can carry each week that can you know make your team even harder to beat. Obviously, uh, but you also can't. It's just like a quarterback, man. You can't get an elite tight end without at least offering the promise of a potential elite tight end to trade in to try to get a Goddard or a, a Mark point. Andrews or a, you know whatever. So I feel like people just gloss over that and say, well. You know, tight ends are, aren't productive, so don't draft them and trade for them later. Like, I mean, yeah, I guess that's great, but you're not getting them from a guy like me. I no, mean, and and look at a guy like like I, I like two of the points you made there. I mean, first of all, the val- look at a guy like Trey McBride, who basically did nothing, had a terrible first, you know, eleven games last season. Ertz got injured, and he did a few things, and his sure. value is still, you know, he was going at the two oh six last year. He's still probably worth the late second now. And the other point that you made. If you want to go up, which I have in almost all of my leagues, guys like Pitts or Mark Andrews, these really top players, or Kelsey, if you want to go up and get one of those guys, it's either a guy who has Kelsey who's now deciding to rebuild or a guy who has Andrews who needs to break him down. He's <laughs> sure. going to ask for a good young tight end back in almost all cases, unless you're a tight end hoarder like you know I honestly am, as you'll see Same. in my second round pick. <laughs> yeah. But I, 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 there's a lot of value to be had in a guy like Kincaid, and he, he's the type of guy that if he has a good first month of the season, you will never be able to buy him. Agreed. I mean, look at the pits. Look at the pits where we're at. I mean, still, I mean, some people are ready to cut bait and, you know, which patience is not something that dynasty values do a great job with it. Dynasty owners. Yeah. Do a great job, with. which is wild because it's the point of dynasty to be a little patient, you know, but I mean, there are still plenty of plenty of people who are putting, even if you're trading for pits, the, the benchmark to even get them is is absurd. And back to the McBride point for, for I've also been making a similar point, but then also adding like, if McBride goes in this year and catches 75 balls, he's going to be like a fifth round startup pick next year, like immediately, yeah, which there's absolutely. a very, there's a very easy path for that, for him. Like they have no size. If Hopkins leaves, they have a rookie in Wilson. Everybody else is five, eight or under like he could crush in the red zone. He could, he was a pat. He's not to say that he's on the level of Kincaid, but he was an elite pass catching option in college so like he can be kind of cut from the same cloth a little bit uh obviously uh not quite the same but i i feel like it's wide open for a guy like mcbride and i'm not coming off mcbride for i spent i had mcbride valued i like i was fine with taking him anywhere from two two to two four last year me too um and and did in some cases and no you're not getting him from me because i believe in the talent and and i i in tight end premium especially deeper benches you're gonna see me with six, seven tight ends down at the bottom of my bench because I'm just going to have them there. And, you know, as either trying to move up on a tight end that I to, to, you know, increase my my tight end that I have, or they're also nice little kickers in trades, even if they don't like necessarily work out. And like, you know, the Gerald Everett's of the world and those guys, like they still had a little shimmer that if you can't quite get a trade done, hey, I'll kick in Gerald Everett here. And obviously Gerald Everett, you know, turned into be okay and had a nice season and he's been around, but I like to keep those guys at the bottom of my bench and tight end premium. So I, I really like the pick. Um, and, you know, I'm not not going to be terribly upset about it. I might take Quentin Johnston and Addison and, and I'd be OK with Flowers and ahead of Kincaid. 
but I, I'm not certainly not going to argue at all. With, with yeah, and I and I do have Kincaid and QJ and Addison all in all in the same tier and like same. relatively close to each other. Uh, I, I'm a little bit lower on Flowers than that. But the thing about Kincaid is you look at the Bills' offense and 60 percent of Knox's snaps last year were either in the slot or out wide. And I mean, if you look at, I'm sure the Bills like Knox. They gave him an okay contract, but he's really been playing because they haven't had anyone better. So I right. see no reason why Kincaid can't take that role. I mean, he's not a very good pass blocker, which from a fantasy perspective is a good thing. <laughs> and the Bills had two tight ends on the field on 35% of the snaps. You know, that gives Knox, I, I still think Knox is going to play, you know, 60, 70% of the snaps. Last year he was at 80. There's room for both of these guys in the offense to get on the field. But when you talk about the red zone targets, Knox got a bunch of fade routes. Like if you've seen Kincaid's contested catch and lead leaping ability it's obvious to see why they wanted a guy like him in that offense and how they're going to use him what, what, sure. what i would kind of conclude with as far as the potential reach on him is that i've taken kincaid in 18 drafts so far i have only taken him Ooh. at the one seven twice and one of those was a two tight end tight end premium league the other one was a full point tight end premium league so in general i'm find myself trading back like taking basically anything because i know that most of my league mates are going to take QJ or Addison. I'll trade back to the 109 and get a push up from, you know, the 207 to the 203. Uh, honestly, like a negative quote unquote value trade. But because I know I want Kincaid anyways, you can pick up a little bit extra like that. Right. 18. Yep. That's really pushing your chips all the way in right there. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in, yeah, I am diversify in a, that portfolio a little. No, I, I am in an unhealthy amount of leagues. So <laughs> yeah. that's only, it's only about 35%. So it doesn't, 35%. Like, I'm not a good at math, but I mean, I'm decent at math, but that sounds like a lot. Oh I, uh, I, I, I'm in, I'm in about eight, 83 leagues now. Cause I got three startups going on right now. Um, but, uh, only about 60, 65 of them have had drafts so far, but yeah, that's, in, I don't that's, even uh, kidding me. I need a secretary to keep track of that. Yeah. You need an accountant <laughs> to account to count it. Um, uh, but yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question is, is or in the last question would, would, if able to trade, obviously we can't, you would try to trade down and, and we talk about it a decent amount, like in drafts, you don't know. I mean, obviously you want to win every trade the best you can, but sometimes if you know, you can get that and you, and you don't a want to put in the work or don't think you, it's okay to, like you said, I'll kind of take a, in, in, in the view of percentages, a, a net negative of a, of a quote unquote trade to get it done, move back two spots, but you're still moving up. It's, it's not what people think you should be getting, but it's, it's okay to, to, to not publicly win. Yeah. And trade with their perception. And, and the way I think about it is if you want Kincaid at anyways, either you take him at one seven and you're losing value there. And then you still have, let's say the worst pick in the second round, or you move back, get Kincaid at a decent value. And even if you didn't gain a lot, it's something. So yeah. I, I'm pretty much always in favor for that. I, I did that a lot at the 104 and the 105 because I'm pretty ambivalent. I, I have Gibbs over Stroud and I'm pretty ambivalent between Stroud and JSN. So when I had the opportunity, if I knew a guy at the 104 wanted Stroud, I want Gibbs anyways. Sometimes you can charge a lot because get, they're getting the last sure. quarterback on the board. So I, sure. I'm doing that type of move a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just you got to know who you're dealing with and know where the values are um, and be OK with not perceptively winning every single trade, but saying, hey, I'm OK with moving back a couple of spots and moving up this other one uh, and not just crushing every trade. So yeah. I like the pick. I like the insight. And uh, we'll we'll see you at two seven. Awesome. We got Jeff Bell at one eight. Jeff, where can we find you before we uh, hear the details on 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 the one eight selection? So you can find me with football guys. Most all of my content comes through football guys, the football guys, college football show. I'm talking about co podcast pre-show that that comes out weekly, the podcast and a live stream that you can find on YouTube on Thursdays. Um, all kinds of dynasty content coming up on football guys. And then you can find me with the Debbie Royale as well. We have a Patreon, we have a discord hanging out there. So Twitter, you can find me on Twitter for whom J Bell tolls, but all the regular places. Nice. Yeah, you can catch the uh, the, the Devi Royale on YouTube as well, right? That's correct. Yes, we have all kinds of short videos coming up all the time, and and some longer form stuff too. Very good. So a bit of a controversial one eight here, I think, for some people. So so who'd you got? What were you thinking here? 
So I took Quentin Johnson and and I have Quentin Johnson as my wide receiver too. Really, once you get to this point, you're looking at either Johnston or Jordan Addison, whoever might be on the board, or depending on settings, you might go with Dalton Kincaid because I think that we have a very solidified top six when you're in rookie drafts. And so you're kind of weighing the options there. I have Johnston over Addison. I look long-term, the upside being paired with Justin Herbert, being the potentially the number one wide receiver in the Chargers offense long-term with Herbert. And, and so that that is a differentiator for me compared to Addison. I think Addison maybe feels like the little bit of a safer play just because we saw a little bit more college production. And I think that it's easy to see him excelling next to Justin Jefferson. But I do think that playing with Jefferson puts a real ceiling on his fantasy outcome, as well as the questions long term on who is going to be the Vikings quarterback. I don't think we have any questions long term on who is going to be playing quarterback for the Chargers. And I think we feel pretty good about that. And Addison and jo- uh, Quentin Johnson's physical gifts profile very, very well as a leading primary receiver. So I for me, I'm going to go Johnston over Addison most most often or not. I think that it's fair if you're in a lot of drafts and you want to split the two and kind of get a little bit equal exposure. That's what I've tried to do with Bryce Young and CJ Stroud a little bit higher up the board. Try to get a little bit equal exposure between the two of them just because there is risk that they don't hit and there is questions about their ultimate upside. But I do think that Johnson's upside is a little bit higher than Addison's. So the ceiling play for the most part here uh, was, was kind of the move for you. Yeah, and I think that if you're drafting at this point, you you probably were a playoff team last year or you've acquired the pick. And so I want to kind of go with that ceiling play a little bit more at the later. Sure. I want to be able to raise my ceiling on on a good, strong roster and, and be able to push me over to winning the championship versus kind of deferring a little bit more to safety on Addison. So if you were at the 1-8 here and you know everything's exactly the same way and you are able to trade do you are you trying to get up are you trying to get back or are you just you're happy with Johnston right here if i can get into the top 6 and it's something reasonable a couple second round picks or something like that i'm i'm thrilled to do that i have found i've probably done maybe 20 live rookie drafts so far that really count. And it's just very hard to get into that top six. I think yeah. if you're sitting in this range, just because it's so very established that there is a tier of six and, and kind of the price that you want to pay. Like I, I'm not willing to give up an extra future first in order to make that move. Like I'll just roll the dice on, on Johnson having somewhat similar ceiling as like Jackson Smith and Jigba or whatever it might be. But if I've got some older vets on my roster and I'm looking to turn my roster over a little bit, and I'm okay parting with those so i did one trade it's it's way up the board but i did one trade and i had the 102 and i traded um miles sanders and deandre hopkins and walked away with the 101 and so it was one situation there where i was adding Bijan robinson to that roster i didn't particularly need the second quarterback at the 102 and so i was willing to give up a little bit of production on the back end so so things like that if if i can do that to move around the board i'll give you a little bit of veteran production or maybe i'll give you a couple seconds to move up but outside i don't like trading future first because you never know where those are going to end up <laughs> sure. and, and like i i want to add a, a premier player with one of those picks and so um, if i can move up i will um i'm not interested in moving back at this position, I don't think. I, um, I think that once you get through the 109, really the 110, kind of Zay Flowers, Dalton Kincaid go off the board. Um, I think the 111, I don't see much difference between 111 and even like 302 to that point. I think that Ooh. there's a, a big, massive tier of players yeah. there. And so uh, I've been in a position where I've had the 111 in some leagues and I've either rolled it forward to a future 24 first or i've just moved back and and accumulated multiple shots really throughout that second round early third round yeah i mean i I definitely kind of feel what you're saying there a a little bit so but no love for for zay flowers uh over addison or johnson no not in my mind i think that there's pretty clear separation i mean i know they they went right in order in the nfl draft but um, i think long term i feel very comfortable about the potential ceiling on johnston i have a little bit more questions on zay flowers on if he gets there on volume in that baltimore offense because Mm -hmm. having mark andrews there i think it's it's easy to forget about him being a tight end relative to wide receivers but he's certainly going to get his fair share of target share And, and then rashad bateman whatever plays out with him i just think that there's a little bit more of a very real ceiling on zay flowers relative to the other two gotcha all right well we'll uh we'll catch you at at 
two eight. All right. So coming in at one nine, we got Scott Connor, the Warp Warrior. Interested to uh, get your take on some of these draft picks here. So at one nine, what you got? Yeah, this is one of those tough spots in the draft where I'm glad the board played out how it did the first eight. Uh, Normally, this would be one of those picks where it's kind of the no man's land, dead zone. Uh, Anyone that's followed me knows in this format, 1.5 tight end premium. I don't want to take tight ends. Probably wouldn't take a tight end until at least the mid second. I don't care who the profile is. It's got to be like a super, super outlier profile for me to consider it. So I don't want to take a tight end. There's a clear top six. They're already gone. So I'm stuck in this wide receiver range. Uh, Luckily, I was able to select my wide receiver to Jordan Addison at 109. Thank goodness somebody took a tight end before me. It's exactly (laughs) what I want to see. So I actually had choices. I wasn't stuck with taking the last of the four first round receivers, which did happen in quite a few drafts where it just goes JSN and then boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So if you're in that top nine, you know you're getting a first round receiver. It just may not be the one that you're able to stack with whatever quarterback you have. May not be the one you like at all, but you go, okay, do I not take the first round receiver in lieu of a running back or a tight end or a second round receiver or a late second round receiver? So I think it's a pretty obvious tier break here. Luckily, I had choices between Addison and Flowers. Very happy to go Jordan Addison at 109. I wish this happened in all my drafts where I had the 108 or 109. I'd feel really good about it. So if you were in the 109 in a draft before it started, would you be actively trying to to move up? Or are you moving back? Or what are you just waiting to see how it plays out? I was in this spot quite a few times where I had either Kirk Cousins or Justin Herbert or Lamar Jackson. And I'm fine stacking in this range. Uh, The best, the most valuable place to stack is typically not at the very, very high end. It's at the range where it's like right in your flexes or in your last startable position. So you're talking about like streaming tight ends or wide receiver threes or flexes. So this is the perfect class. One of the saving graces about this receiver class is you can stack all four of the receivers nicely. They're all quarterbacks that were top 15 quarterbacks or are currently top 15 quarterbacks. So they're nice to stack. And in three of the four cases, they're not the most expensive stack. And you could argue all of them. If you talk Zay flowers versus Mark Andrews or Bateman, they're not the most expensive player to stack either, which is nice. You know, you're not chasing a team's wide receiver one where we're steaming that player all the way up into the top 10 already in dynasty. Maybe JSN is right on the fringe, but you could stack them. So when I was in these spots, I'm like, man, I'd love to get Addison on the Cousins teams, Zay on the Lamar Jackson teams, Quentin Johnston on the Justin Herbert teams. Only works out about half the time. I don't even think it's on purpose. I think it's just if I have Herbert and I have the 109, the league where I don't have Herbert, Johnston goes to the 109. The league I want to get him, someone takes him at the 107. So I think you just have to accept you're getting a first-round receiver. Uh, I like 109 better than 110 or 111 or 112. Yeah, Uh, because then you're hoping for a mistake. But I don't think you try to move around unless it's like, okay, I have to get to the 107 because I'm just going to take Quentin Johnston or Zay Flowers. And I didn't do that. The teams where I had like Cousins or Lamar or Herbert, I wasn't moving to the 107 to secure my guy. It was kind of like, hey, I'm in 50 leagues. I'll just let things fall where they may. Yeah. So how, it's, how it's much not, does ahead. that, how much does that stack weigh in? Like if, if you had, let's say you're at the one nine and you have the option of flowers and Addison and you have Lamar Jackson on that team, are you going to take flowers over Addison because you have Lamar? Obviously I'd try to trade back a spot and <laughs> tempt fate that the person ahead of me does not ruin my stack. Yeah. For the, for the way that I play, uh, I play in a portfolio. I play in a ton of leagues I think for the most part, when you're talking Addison, Johnston, Flowers, the value of the potential stack is higher than the randomness that I know which receiver is better than the others. So I think unless I'm at a point where at one one point I had seven Zay Flowers shares and only like three of the others, Mm -hmm. then I'm like, ah, man, you know, do I want to take more Zay Flowers? Because he typically was falling. There were a couple drafts where you could get Zay Flowers at the 110, 111, 112, like someone would take a tight end or a running back over him. So I would have probably passed on him 
but I would have taken the other ones if I could stack. I would have taken them, you know, in the order that made sense. The stack's worth more than the profile. Gotcha. I can't say that I'm looking that hard at stacks. Is that is that a mistake in your mind there? So I'll plug this. Uh, Fantasy Footballers DFS wrote an article back in 2021. I always go back to it when it comes to stacking. And they essentially just ran a correlation analysis on the best place to stack. Now it's DFS, but we play a head-to-head game in Dynasty, right? right. We do play a head-to-head game. Uh, and the two places that correlated the highest was at like the the wide receiver three range. So think like a Josh Allen, Gabe Davis stack is actually worth more than a Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs stack because Diggs is already in your lineup. There's a very good chance Davis is in that like fringe where I'm deciding two or three guys with him. Mm -hmm. The stack there is more valuable. So that's kind of just my default range where I put these rookie receivers. Certainly do a couple of them probably have the upside to far exceed that range. Yes, but as of right now, like I'm chasing that stack because I don't know who's going to be better between Quentin Johnston or Zay Flowers or Jordan Addison. So I'm okay getting the yeah. stack if it comes to me or reaching one pick over the other. I'm not going to go trade. I wouldn't move from the 109 to the 107 if I had Kirk Cousins to draft Jordan Addison. Put it that way. I'd be fine with just whoever falls to me. Gotcha. But if if it's just there, yeah, sure, I'll prioritize the stack. All right. And so there was just to wrap up this this pick here. There wasn't there was no thought of a running back or Levis ever in your mind here. No, I uh I love Levis. I went to Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky fan. Not here. Not over a first round receiver. I yeah. get it. He's going to get opportunity. I think the tiebreaker with Levis, whether you guys agree or not, people don't like him. Yeah. This isn't a guy I go, oh, as soon as he starts, I'll be able to flip him for a first. You know, as soon as he starts, it'll be, well, I can't wait till he so that, busts. That public That's what opinion weighs in yes. harder for you. Yeah. It it has to. You're it right. has to. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, well, if I know half those the people guys in the, that the public will carry the value for you, you know. I, half my league is out on him before he even plays. Yeah. So what is he? I put a I put a poll out on Twitter about a month ago. If you don't like Will Levis, what does he need to do for you to buy him? And some of the answers are just wild, you know, 30 <laughs> touchdowns, 4,000 yards, you know, yeah. be Justin Herbert. I'm like, come on, those are not realistic right. expectations. Yeah. Well, one last thing to your point about people loving the value. Kincaid is like a cult folk hero, but I don't know if we have time. I don't know how much time you got to get into why you would never, why you're not taking, not thinking about Kincaid at all. Had he been there like at one nine? Okay, I'll give you a 30 second answer. All right. Perfect. In a 1.5 premium, it, taking Kincaid with a first round pick, you are, you essentially need to hit like a Dallas Goddard, TJ Hawkinson level range. If he doesn't get there, you, you're probably shooting short with the shot on that pick. That's it. Now he could get there. His profile isn't great. He's 23. He'll be 24. He's 6'3. There's not a great history of 6'3 tight ends being full time tight ends. I know the he's going to play in the slot. Though. The ones that are. Good though they're pretty dang good. I, I well, you're from everything you've gone on with. You, you're, the probability of that is going to make you be it's out. It's a low probability. If <laughs> yeah. I'm wrong, I'll, you right. it's on it's on recording that I'm wrong in like ten different places. That's sure, sure. So if Will Levis gets first round capital, I mean, I, I know you're playing mostly the court of public opinion, but if if Will Levis had gotten first round capital, does that change your opinion? He still puts first mayonnaise in his coffee. I mean, so I don't. But yeah, the public's opinion of that shit, you know. First round capital, top ten, yes. Uh, okay. If he would have gone thirtieth, because the team traded up two spots from where they picked him, or four spots from where they picked him, yeah, probably not as significant. I'd be fine still taking the receiver. All right, coming in at one ten, we got the leader of the flock, Mister Mason Dodd. How you doing, buddy? What uh, what was your thought process leading up to this pick where you get get the guy that you hope for here uh and then what overall was the pick well i saw we got pick 10 and i was like well um this sucks we are going to be in a spot where we're going to see quentin johnson jordan addison and zay flowers go right before us then i'm going to be sitting over here sweating wondering if i'm supposed to take dalton kincaid will levis zach charbonnet i don't know where i'd go but Mm. luckily I, i check in to see where the draft's at we have Dalton Kincaid going to pick seven. So I'm like, okay, well, this is going to make my life easy. I'm going to get one of these wide receivers now. 
So then we have Zay Flowers falling to us at pick 10. Zay Flowers is pretty much the last guy in this tier. He is going to be significantly better than Devon A. Chain, Will Levis, or any prospect you'd be looking at behind him. Pretty much an auto pick here. I will want to be on record saying that I don't perceive Zay Flowers to be in the same tier as Johnston Addison. I know that some people uh, love Zay Flowers. And while, yeah, I definitely think he has some strong points on his profile, right? I mean, this is a wide receiver that does dominate as a junior. This is a wide receiver that continues to get better as senior season. At the end of the day, it is historically a big red flag for a wide receiver to stay four years in college. And if we're looking at the historical hit rate that you're going to find from that player, it will negatively impact him. So, What's Flowers, the in my mind, not as good as Addison Johnson, but still definitely uh, significantly better than any prospect you'd be looking at after. What's the hit rate with with four year wide receivers? Is it, what's the what's the threat? Like, is it a percentage of them that that are only going to hit, and then you want to stay away from that low of a percentage? Is that the is that the thought? So what that? I did, uh, I went back through Dynasty ADP for rookie drafts since the year 2014, and I went and did a ton of charting on how ADP changed over time from year one, their rookie season, where they're being drafted going into the year, year two, year three. And then we track that by different measurables, right? So we were able to go through and say, okay, well, if a wide receiver runs slower than a four, six, oh, where is he historically drafted his rookie season, his second year and his sophomore year? And you'll see, okay, if a wide receiver runs slower than a 4.60 40-yard dash, historically speaking, he loses value after his rookie season and loses value again after his second year, X percentage of the time. And we compare that to players on the opposite end of the spectrum. And we did this for essentially every major metric that you could find. And historically speaking, since the year 2014, you found that wide receivers that stayed four years in college actually were more likely to lose dynasty value after their rookie season compared to wide receivers that actually declared as true juniors. So, I mean, there have been a ton of different studies about it. We did our own. We have our own little measure in our wide receiver prospect model. But essentially, it just makes a lot of sense in that if you were a wide receiver that was able to dominate as a sophomore, dominate as a junior, and you were already able to go to the NFL and have that talent profile at 21 years old, we can assume that you continue to develop. Whereas some of these guys that stay for their fourth season, usually there's a red flag in that. Of course, you'll find your outliers where you'll have maybe – Jerry Judy making Devonta Smith stay because Smith is on a roster that has Jalen Waddle, Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, and John Mechie. Maybe you see Chris Olave staying for a fourth season because he's on a roster that had Jamison Williams, Garrett Wilson, Jackson Smith, and Jigba. And then at the very end, Marvin Harrison Jr. You'll find those outlier type scenarios. And yeah, I think that we should probably ignore them when we're talking about some of the best wide receiver rooms in college football history. Uh, Boston college is not that. So I'm not giving Zay flowers that same benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Well, you, I, you could also say he had to stay because of lack of quarterback play. Potentially um, that could have been a reason why you, your stock isn't high enough to justify you going out. You know, you're a better player than that. If like if we NIL. Could just get, our quarterback play has been so bad. If we could just get steady, uh, whatever I for, I'm drawing a blank on the quarterback from Boston college's name when he actually played, but maybe that was some of the, like you were kind of saying, it could be the receiving core that as in, you know, uh, Devonta Smith stayed because of Judy, like maybe, maybe flower stayed because of a lack of a, quarterback room or a healthy quarterback rather um do you think there's anything to that or no personally that's not not how i play dynasty okay. fantasy football i think if we're looking at the large large sample size that we went through since 2014 mm -hmm. i mean there are probably a lot of wide receivers that stayed a fourth year because of bad quarterback play that's just not how i play the game like i said i think zay flowers is still definitely the best player on the board hell i i mean i'm took him in this draft sure. just wanted to illustrate that he does have a red flag that some of the other wide receivers ahead of him uh, don't have yeah. So would you be obviously if Zay fell here, let's say Kincaid was here. Um, one, would you take Kincaid Two, would this be a spot where you were trying to trade out or are you if you're in 10, are you consistently trying to trade up regardless of what what how the board breaks down before the draft even starts? Oh, yeah. Before the draft starts, I, I would love to move away from pick 10. I know a lot of people are pumped on Dalton Kincaid. In general, I don't like drafting rookie tight ends. We do take a few rookie tight ends later on here. But 
if I'm at 10 and we're looking at being boxed out where Dalton Kincaid's most likely our pick, I generally try to move up to get to pick seven, pick eight. That way I can't come away away with Addison or Johnston. I mean, obviously, if we could get to being a top six pick where we could have a shot at Gibbs, JSN, Stroud, that'd be even better. But usually you're having to pay an extreme premium for that. If you can't, say, do anything in that regard to move up, would you be okay with moving down a little bit here? Definitely. I think 110 is the cutoff where I'd trade 110 for any random 2024 first. And if I were to look to trade back from 110, assuming Zay Flowers does not fall, I think that I would honestly be fine trading back to like the middle of the second round and picking up an additional asset or maybe even just trading pick 10 straight up and going and getting a tight end that I like, maybe like Pat Frymuth instead. Gotcha. So there's not a whole lot of circumstances where you're coming out with Kincaid here. I mean, I will take him if I need to, but in general, if you're looking at the rookie season production for tight ends, it's just never there. And if you look at a player like Pat Frymuth, for instance, I mean, if we're tracking tight ends since the year 2000 to have as many receptions per game as Pat Frymuth as a rookie, as well as a sophomore, you literally only have guys like, I mean, Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez, Jimmy Graham, Jordan Reed, Jeremy Shockey. I mean, like the who's who of tight end George Kittles on the list. And even with him going through and putting up that historic year one, year two production, you still really can't get a mid first round pick for him. So I'm just not about drafting a rookie tight end in the first round life, even if it's a phenomenal landing spot in Buffalo. No, no interest at all in Will Levis. No thought crosses your mind with Levis at, at 10. Even let's say Flowers isn't there. So, I mean, if Will Levis would have gotten the NFL draft capital expected, I'd be willing to take Will Levis mid round one of super flex drafts. I mean, personally, how I approach the quarterback position in dynasty is I'm willing to throw my hands up in the air and go, you know what? I'm an idiot. I don't think anybody (laughs) knows how to evaluate these quarterbacks from a dynasty perspective. So if they get the draft capital and they're like a top five pick and we can guarantee they have a starting job for years to come, they have the job security, then yep, I'll go through and I'll take that guy mid round one. If NFL talent evaluators check that box for us. But when he falls to round two, It really does tell us that this is a guy that doesn't have any job security. If he goes in there and gets an opportunity maybe for three or four weeks and he just looks bad, then hell, he's Malik Willis. He's out of the starting job and he never gets another shot. So historically speaking, those those round two tight ends definitely have upside. And I think depending on the format, he could be in play if it was a six point passing touchdown league, or maybe if it was a 14 team super flex league rather than a 12 team super flex league, I would definitely be considering Levis. And yeah, I think Levis is still in consideration given your roster, but I mean, him falling to the second round of the NFL draft. I mean, obviously he has to fall down dynasty rookie drafts. Yeah. And I think we've, you've seen that he's basically back end of the first and a lot of super flex, you know, pretty consistently at this point, anywhere, basically one ten to one twelve. They were trying to trade into the back into the first, but does that really not matter? Even if he would have gone into the first, it's not high enough in the first there. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking at what we've historically seen from these quarterbacks, if you're a top three pick, if you're Trubisky, if you're Bortles, you can fail for four years straight and still get starting job after starting job after starting job. Like a team's not going to go away from you for a very long time. But I mean, if you are, say, a late round one pick, early round two pick, you are going to be giving up on quickly if it does not work (laughs) out. Like if you fall outside the top 10 picks, you're Josh Rosen, you know, you're Dwayne Haskins. Like if if you're not good, you're one. uh, They're quick to say bye to you if you don't have that team investment. All right. Well, so we got we got Zay Flowers. We're pretty happy about it. A red flag. But uh, overall, you were glad Zay Flowers was there. Definitely saved your draft. We got the 111 and we got Jax Falcone, our first time uh, meeting and and speaking to you. So I'm excited to get down to business. The receipt king is in the building. So uh, we pop. (laughs) What do you got here? I love it. What were you thinking? What were you hoping for? And then what was the pick at 111? Yeah, you know, um, at 111, I took Devon A-Chain. And you know what's crazy about this? When did we do this? Like, actually, this draft was like maybe... Like a week after the NFL draft or so? Right? So it was like a little bit ago. And, you know, of course, getting it all together. You know, it's a slow draft, yada, yada. Then you got to do all the the... the the footage get us all in the studio and make this happen. And Ooh. since then I've probably <laughs> gone back and forth. I'm probably in about 20 drafts, uh, 20, you know, rookie, rookie drafts and, and dynasty leagues. And I've split it up between Dev- Devon a chain and someone else that actually fell way, way farther. I'm a Kendra Miller guy and Same. I don't want to spoil it, but I was definitely either Kendra or Devon a chain in this spot generally. Um, so for me, it was just like, 
I don't, I, I didn't know which way to go, but Devon A chain offers a, a specific kind of upside. Um, you know, since this draft, we have also heard that he's kind of uh, put on some weight, mm-hmm. um, which is exciting. Mm. Uh, the reason given for him putting on weight kind of made a lot of sense to me too, is like he's a track star. And so therefore in the off seasons, he's always looking to stay lean and light. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, sure. He looked a little swole when he went in there, not as swole as Tua, but um, he's looking <laughs> yeah. pretty good out there. So I, I really like Devon A. Chain and his you know four three wheels, especially in that offense with a lot of speed around him. So for a lot of those reasons, especially if you're a win now team, you know to, to catch lightning in a bottle like almost literally with Devon A. Chain is a good pick in the late first. Yeah, no, I I, I agree there. If I have to, uh, I'm probably taking Kendra over A. Chain in the Me first too, there. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think Kendra is my only outside of Gibbs and, and Bijan and super flex tight end premium is probably going to be my only other uh, oh, running can... back in the first round. But I do like a chain for a lot of the things that you said. I don't have a, necessarily a problem with it. It's basically the old I'll take him at two one, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Not in the right. first, <laughs> right. right. Uh, which is, you know, semantics. Uh, one of those F's is for fun. Right. And uh, a chain puts the fun in dynasty fantasy football. Yeah. That's true. He, he sure does. And, and no one wants to have any fun anymore. Let's have a little yeah. fun, you know? So what, yes. it, it, every time I've pushed the button on him, you know, it's been a whatever, you know, however many times I've been faced with that Kendra a chain uh, decision. I've gone about 50, 50. I think I've like four to three or whatever, uh, a chain over Kendra, whatever, you know, um, long story short, every time I push that button, I've been like, all right, let's go. Yeah. You know, yeah, you feel, feel good. Right. You That's know, with you Kendra, know. you know, there's going to be a little bit of a weight potentially, although who knows? And then, uh, shameless name drop but i had jj zacharyson on the pod uh mm-hmm. recently and he won the argument versus me about actually having zach charbonnet potentially at his rb3 and i'm a i am just a scrambled mess in my brain with those <laughs> three guys so with those three players if you're that way you can also trade back which is dino game theory which is what i am so you know for me if you can trade back gain some value and just still get one of those three guys i think it's worth doing so that was going to be my follow up question. What, what what would be your at one eleven? Is it typically stay in draft? Is it move up? Is it move back? You know, is it just depend on how the board's falling or you go in pre draft or what's your? You're definitely gonna have a shot at those three running backs most likely. So yeah, I've made a couple plays late in the in the first round. One one of my favorite moves was in a tight end premium. Dalton Kincaid slipped to me, and I traded that late pick for twenty four first, and I felt really good about it because you know obviously a late first. You know, the 24 first, a random 24 first is likely to be earlier, but it was tight end premium. So the player was kind of like the the other manager was really excited to get Kincaid. And, you know, so it kind of, you know, pushed him to want to make that move. So, yeah, for me, it was a great move. I think in that league, I have like, you know, whatever I have like Hawkinson, Andrews and Njoku or something. You know, I'm pretty stacked. So didn't really need the tight end. Love the, the future capital of a 24 first. And who knows how high that could go, you know? Right. No, no thought of Levis or, or a tight end. Is this tight end premium mayor here uh, at all? Tight end premium made this kind of a funny little draft. I, you know, it's, I don't really like drafting tight ends in the first round. I was, I famously faded Kyle Pitts. And I think that was kind of correct, especially in that class. Cause you would have had to have given up, you know, uh, ETN or Najee or Jamar chase in many cases. Mm-hmm. So I've got a few Jamar chase, you know, shares where, you know, Pitts would have been the play for a lot of a lot of people. So I, I, I just want to stay away from tight ends in the first round in general. So for me, not as much. I wasn't as much. And Will Levis, not a huge fan of the prospect, but I did think about it because in, in super flex quarterbacks right. are an amazing uh, asset at all times. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're, we're right on the same page with a lot of thought process here of I don't really I'm, I'm up next. You haven't seen it yet, but I took <laughs> Levis at 112, um, you know, and it's not that I love Levis. It's just the, the, the process of the value. And, you know, if you if you want to get a quarterback, you kind of got to give a quarterback. And, and yeah. you know, he's still holding pretty good value. And, you know, we're not exactly sure what we're going to get in Tennessee just yet. And I, I didn't love the guy, but I, I feel like at, at the end of the first early second, Levis has got to be on the table for you totally kind of regardless he, he's gonna he's gonna play probably this year i mean you know i would imagine they're gonna play it like Tannehill's the starter until that team isn't good right right something like that and that team's probably not gonna be good so <laughs> i mean i know. don't know they're like always good even with all those injuries even they when almost they're not made good. the playoffs yes, last year with all those crazy injuries they bring in josh dobbs and almost if they'd have won that game i think they were would have been in 
Yeah. Yeah. Vrabel's a hell of a coach. He's going to get the most out of that team. But, you know, at some point the the ride comes to an end and it may be this year. You know, there's been some whispers of trading Derrick Henry. So, you know, yeah. for all those reasons, I think Will Levis is an OK pick. I mean, even if he's just a 2024 potential starter, it's OK. I would think with the early round two capital, they're probably going to give him that shot. You know, there's been I, I, I love doing this um, early round two, you know, one, two turn quarterbacks in the NFL draft. You know, Lamar Jackson, Derek Carr, Drew Brees. Been so many good ones, or Paxton Lynch, etc. Right, so <laughs> yeah. you know you can make a case for him. You know, Jalen Hurts, right, uh, as having okay draft capital if he's the guy. You know, I think he's going to get a chance, but he's going to have to be really good to keep it. Yeah. All right. Before we get out of this pick here, give me the short sell on why JJ scrambled your brain on Charbonnet here being in the mix. Well, he, he was the third running back drafted. He was drafted in the second round. He was the only. Uh, you know, running back draft in the second round. Um, as good as uh, Kenneth Walker was, he was not very efficient. He's not doesn't have a very good pass catching. Um, you know, the market uh, share, right? No, but he's never he doesn't have a good pass catching profile ever. Right. You know, right. from college into the pros, he just isn't. You know, he isn't a pass catcher. They might have drafted Zach Charbonnet to be the pass catcher and to be the more efficient running back. Well, what if it's a 50-50 split? Um, it's possible they both are second round picks. He said, you know, he said, just go through the thought experiment of what if it's, he goes, it's certainly possible that he's a bust and he's not good. And Kenneth Walker's the man. He, yes, of course. He goes, well, what are some of the other possibilities? It's possible that he's a more efficient and more favored running back. I mean, they love Chris Carson, a bigger body back who was very efficient. Uh, Pete Carroll has a tendency to kind of go with that type of player. Uh, the, the, the one thing that, uh, Ken Walker wasn't doing was was being efficient. Uh, he was very explosive, but not efficient. They might lean towards the more efficient back. That certainly was Zach Charbonnet. Uh, he's also a better pass catcher. Yeah. And obviously, if, uh, if 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 Ken Walker were to see an injury, uh, Zach Charbonnet would immediately be, I mean, uh, easily an RB one at that point, right? Sure. So. so with all those outs, you know, you, and he might have flex appeal, you know, on a weekly basis. Yeah, and when you I factor in, when you factor in uh Devon a chain, look, Dalvin cook could be there in a minute. They mm -hmm. may not favor him over fucking Jeff Wilson. Pardon me. Can I swear? Yeah, Jeff Wilson sure. and Absolutely. Raheem Mostert for crying out loud. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then Kendra Miller, look, he's got to deal with maybe a Jag, but n nonetheless, the guy who led the league in touchdowns last year and Jamal Williams and Alvin Kamara. So it's not like either of those two guys have like this amazingly clear path. I mean, mm -hmm. Devon a chain, maybe, but he's also 188 pounds. He was like, look, where did you have, uh, he asked me, where did I have uh, a chain Kendra and Charbonnet pre-draft? And I had Charbonnet, then Kendra, then a chain. He goes, well, now you've elevated your, you know, RB seven or eight to the RB three for what reason? And it was only landing spot. And I was like, damn it. Damn it. Yeah. Yeah. I can get behind. I, I agree with most of that. I, I would say the probability of him being a bust is probably unlikely. I think he's yeah. like the easiest evaluate. That was kind of my summation. Of, he was of, our of RB three in a tier of his own pre-draft, but I did have Kendra right, right kind of below there. And, and I really did like, that's Kendra, how I had it, you know, beforehand. And, yep. you know, I, so I don't know. Maybe there's more to the not being efficient than the it's, bottom. It's the, it's the efficiency metrics. It's not the bottom line. It's not the bottom the line are. of yards I've per carry. I've heard this carry. argument a few it's, times. It's, it's, you so. take out like the explosive runs and then. EPA per play. So expected points added per play, whether or not he's, you know, uh, uh, expected yards per play. Obviously yards per r rush. He was great because he'd break off big plays. Once right. he broke free, he was electric. But on a per play basis, he wasn't as efficient. So, you know, if a play would have normally netted three yards, he was getting one. But mm -hmm. then when it normally netted four, he was getting 25, you know, so he was he was explosive, but he wasn't getting, you know, uh, the requisite yards on a play and down by down basis. Uh, that's Ken Walker. So a little, little advanced, but at the end of the day, you know, he wasn't breaking tackles as much as Charbonnet. Charbonnet is obviously a, a tackle breaker, a la David Montgomery, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't, isn't Charbonnet a little bit of a David Montgomery guy? Well, you know, the NFL tends to love these guys who are just pros pros and maybe he's that, you know, I, I don't, I didn't, I don't really see it that way. This is sort of JJ talking a little yeah, bit, yeah, yeah. but it made a lot of sense and it is a, a, a sort of perspective that I hadn't considered. Yeah. I think, I think we, you know, we kind of had a similar ish conversation, maybe not with the efficiency stuff, uh, but just like, yeah, 
after the draft, everybody was so fired up and then took a minute and came back and was like, you know, it's really, it really isn't the worst. And and kind of like you said, it, it, it was somebody who you were high on and, and yeah, you got to drop him down a little bit, but yeah. it doesn't need to be to the middle of the second round. I think he, he could still be an item up at two, one, which I, you know, I'm not going to really, I would take Kendra over him <laughs> still, but me too. I would take Charbonnet right after him though. I yep. don't have any problem with that for, from everything that you said the past, like, like I said, it was one of those guys that we came away with and the, my summation was just, it was an easy uh, right. review of the film of like, this is pretty an easy breakdown. He's e- the pass catching is easy. It's not like Jamar Gibbs level route running or anything, but the hands are smooth and natural. He's, he's, you know, a he's very reliable. smooth, natural, right, right. Good, he's reliable. good pass that's, throw, right. That's ultimately what, you know, could lead to him getting more touches in a Pete Carroll coached offense, right? Yeah. You know, that's kind of the whole point of the of the take is what if it just is leaning more towards Charbonnet on a down-by-down basis and Ken Walker sort of this, you know, I, I just don't see it that way, but it's possible. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. You know, that's right. all that, that, that he was basically saying. What if it is does happen? And the most likely is that it's what a 60 40 split, 65 right. 35. With maybe so a little more passing getting. work going Charbonnet's way. Which, I mean, right? Walker caught 27 balls, 35 targets. You know, he looked, I think he blew his college reception total out of the water and yeah. had games where he's catching three balls a game. You know, I, I can't really ask much more from Kenneth Walker. I can't argue that Charbonnet can come in there and definitely get passing work. It yeah. uh, looks like. Well, I just, I just can't see that there. The other argument is like, there's just no reason, like, you knew they were going to draft a backup because they needed one. You just didn't think it was going to be this guy in the yeah. second round. And in there's the no reason round. you're just not going to draft another running back in the second round and not use him. So regardless of what you think of Kenny's passing ability, like it seems like Charbonnet is going to take some, if not a decent role of the passing ability and be, you know, just give that. The Seahawks are a team that do not give a fuck what you think. They they will run right. the shit out of the ball if it is yep. working, and they and, will and use don't those two guys. Don't believe what they say. Believe what they do. Right. R- I mean, right. ultimately, they did draft this motherfucker in the second round, so right. that's what they did. Right. Um, they drafted them both in the second round. I mean, I know you know Walker got better draft capital in the second round, but whatever. They took him with the pick they had in the second yeah. round, even when they had Kenneth Walker. So right. it is right. it is a it is a substantial. Again, I'm I'm not there. I don't yeah, have yeah. him ahead, but the thought experiment was like, dang. You're smart, JJ. You know, it's all yeah, it really yeah, is. Yeah. Like, fuck, I should really yeah. be considering it from a different angle, you know? So the pick was A-Chain. We covered A-chain. some Charbonnet. Uh, Jax, tell us where we can find uh, all your information and all your shows and your Twitter and all that good stuff. Yeah, man. Just find me on uh, on Twitter at Dino Game Theory. You can find us uh, at The Undroppables on Twitter, theundroppables.com. And my show, man, The Undrafted. Uh, you can just search The Undrafted. You can search me. You can search The Undroppables. Anywhere podcasts are found, man. Awesome. All right. We'll see you for uh, 211. Was that good? That was great. Except for the Kenneth Walker slander. (laughs) You know, it's not slander. JJ. (laughs) Oh, he's not efficient. He doesn't get balls. He doesn't break tackles. Oh, man. It's crushing it out there. JJ, not you. That was JJ. We'll see, though. We got to get JJ on the show and talk about Kenneth Walker. I have a saying. I have a saying. I say it all the time. Be ready to be wrong. So yeah. whenever I, whenever someone gives me a, a good argument as to why I could be wrong, like if someone just says something stupid, I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Give me another reason. But when JJ does it, I'm like, God, that could be true. In other words, I don't think it's true, but it could be true. Right. <laughs> Nothing that y'all said about Charbonnet do I disagree with either. Any of that. Well, that's the thing. If you right. like Charbonnet and you like Walker, well then they must like both of them too. And if they like both yeah. of them, how are they going to use them? And if right. yeah. they just go by what these two dudes do, who's more likely the goal line back, right? The bigger, more reliable guy. I, I would yeah. think, I mean, it's like, what if he gets goal line and, 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 uh, and targets? Yeah. Shit. That's right. way better than the rest of it. Sure. Uh, just a thought. And, and still going to get some others, you know, stuff and, and has ability to, you know, break, 20 yard runs it's possible man it's possible i I thought he killed them both but you know that's just my emotional sort of reaction when i first saw the pick i was like fuck and you know we were big kenny walker proponents coming into the year um so and i'm not i'm not really necessarily down on either one and i think that's really what we're what you you should kind of come away thinking um now they did add jsn which you know we're hoping that they didn't the, the everything kind of like the Lions situation we're banking that the seahawks take a step forward offensively here Lions taking a step forward offensively to, to feed all these. They're going to uh, have to, right? Right, right. We made it to the end of the first round. And uh, somehow, Casey, random draft pick order. Got the last pick. Very nice Perfect. for you to uh, 
a lot of nice guys finished last, so I don't know why you were last, but um, uh, got some sick family members, so we're, we're having to be remote tonight, so I feel like I got a guest, but I don't. Uh, mm-hmm. but let's t- uh, so tell me about this pick, Casey. Uh, what were you thinking? Who'd you pick? What were you doing? Well, at 112, um, you know, I feel like this is a fairly standard pick, uh, but you know, the whole draft foreshadowing, all, all the guys kind of fell to me and it was it seemed to be pretty easy as we're going uh looking back on this um you know i, I like i could have i could have taken kendra here uh i also would have been fine with with mayor here I, I probably would try to trade back here in this situation move move back a spot or two off off the 112 you know i don't really love the pick and will levis that i took here i don't like don't love the player necessarily um, but, you know, throughout all these offseason startups and, and you know, throughout the, the startups that we've been doing after the draft, like Will Levis, is, is, his value is still, you know, a good bit above where Mayers is and a good bit above where Kendra's is in the FFD ADP uh, mocks that we've been putting on. Uh, so it really just comes down to that. It's a, it's a, it's a value play. You can't trade in this. Uh, I probably would if I could, but, you know, if I if it was ten drafts, I'd probably take Levis in, in three or or four of them, and then you know trade out, get Mayer and and Kendra because I like both of those guys uh, a good bit. So you know that's kind of where my head was at there. Would you be trying to move up based on how this board fell? Um, you know, I w- I would be fine with with trying to move up. Um, you know, I, w- I wouldn't get too crazy, and I think that was kind of the default answer from everybody. Like the move up uh, wasn't wasn't something that they were going to spend a ton of of capital on um but if you know if i could trade you know a minuscule amount of things to get up to zay flowers let's say at 110 i'd be fine with that um but i think i'd be more looking looking in the in the trade back a pick or two um but it's all going to just come down to cost if if it's if it's cheap enough i'll move up if let's say mason was on there and and you know i kind of knew mason's stance and doesn't like the fourth year uh, wide receiver there um, and he's sitting there you know maybe maybe I can maybe I can swing uh, you know a fairly cheap play into grabbing my guy and Zay Flowers there but uh, for the most part probably moving back uh, unless it's cost effective to go up all right any other input I mean uh, we could we could get out of here I don't care what you think yeah I mean I don't <laughs> I, I've, this isn't I've about talked, us Casey right I've talked plenty about this but like I said I mean I think I've I think I've kind of kind of covered it there that Zay Flowers at, at 110 would, would certainly have me uh, excited uh, to 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 try to do something, uh, but I wouldn't wouldn't break the bank. So, yeah, let's uh, let's get out of here. Let's uh, let's see me at uh, see me at 212. Yeah. How yeah. about that? Which uh, will cut to the pre-recorded outro. <laughs> All right. Well, that will wrap up round one. We appreciate you guys. Make sure you're like, subscribed, comment below, five star review, all that jazz. Patreon, Discord, five dollar holler, support your boys. You can get a, a fresh tea at RevelryBrewco.com. Uh, I'm gonna get on on some some new merch here uh, at some point over the summer. Uh, but it's another way to support your support your boys. Get the shirt. It's, it's a great comfy shirt. And again, shout out to all the uh, all the fellas here that that put in extra time and work and and effort to come on the show uh, and be sure to go check out round two and then three and four. 